Hi, and welcome to the Misguided Salon Series. I am your host, Paul Goslin, creator of Misguided. Today, I have a lovely conversation with Justin Klosky, who brings Doyle to life in season three. Today, we talk about Justin's misguided journey, as well as his guiding light role, Joey Lupo, in the CBS daytime drama. We talk about Justin's business, the OCD experience, and what it's like to be a master organizer. Uh, We also dive into what it's like, again, to be successful as an artist. Enjoy. Great. Justin, hi, hi, hi. Hi, hi Paul. What's going on? We're here in digital land. We are, we are doing this. Welcome to the Misguided Salon series. Oh, I love myself a good salon. I, me too. It's so yeah. nice. You got to take care of yourself. Yeah, I try my, listen, it's been, uh, it's been hard during the pandemic, but I feel like we're coming out of it. So I know. I feel like we've rounded a corner. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's, it's happening. Yes. And it's not just the guiding light beacon. Look at that. It all comes full circle. <laughs> um, so I sort of been beginning uh, about talking about our origin stories with everybody. And I was curious if you remember how you became a part of uh, Misguided. Ah, uh, how I became a part of Misguided. Uh, my journey into Misguided, you came into my dream one night and I saw your face before I even knew you. And I was like, I have to meet Paul. That that was my no, but that was, <laughs> that was really incredible. Um, I was brought in because of Stephanie, um, who played my Tammy, or I played her Joey on Guiding Light. Let's say I played her Joey because sure. she she was Tammy, right? Um, and she's like, "I'm doing this great thing. I've been working with this guy named Paul. You need to meet him." He's a hustler. He's so excited about you know what he's putting together, and he's working with old soap actors. Would you take a, a call or me? I'm like Stephanie, whatever you need, of course. And then you and I got on the phone and we met, and I was sold. Like you, you're just so charismatic and charming, and you had this vision for what you wanted to do. And I was like, well, who's me to stand in the way of this guy's vision? So <laughs> that's how it all worked out. I know. And I've talked about this um, before, kind of how the universe puts people together, you know, when they're supposed to meet and and um, it, it really came together with Stephanie and I, Stephanie and I, and, and, and we talked a lot about the universe. Um, but I also think the universe keeps people apart until they're ready to be together. Mm. Um, Cause I don't know if you remember, but I reached out to you for season two and you to play Bauer and you were unavailable. You were traveling. There was some something. Um, but I think it's also because the universe wasn't ready for us to yeah. be married. You yeah. play Doyle, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a much bigger obviously. role. It was like a, the, my, my love, you know. But yeah, I think that that was uh, a really interesting way. And then, you know, going through all of these photos, trying to find out... Um, as I've been organizing my, my life and, and whatnot, I went to a lot of soap opera events back in the day. And uh, we had crossed paths as well, the same way I met Stephanie. But we also never really, uh, I don't even think I had a photo with you. I had like an autograph on a, on a program once. and Which is so was- wild to me. I, you know, it's so, those, those events that we had to go to were so overwhelming for me. I didn't, I never got, I never got used to them. I still don't get used to it, like things where like I'm there as like the center of something having to like, it's, there's so, as you know, now being mm-hmm. in red carpets and being with people, like it becomes so overwhelming as someone with OCD and ADHD, my brain just going, bing, 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 bing. so yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad I, the universe kept us apart until we actually needed to be together. Yeah, and I, I really I appreciate the universe for doing that because I, I, I really like our friendship and I, I really value what uh, it has become. Um, Me too. And having you work on the show was really special because I think you were the first actor in three seasons um, that wanted to like run lines ahead of filming. Um, no, one else I, to, no one else wanted to work on stuff before they got there? I mean, not really. No, nobody had that. 
I mean, we were also working really fast. Like I didn't have such uh, such soap actors, <laughs> such soap actors. All the ladies and all the people who are doing your show are like, ah, I'm gonna just show up and do it. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm like, we need to get it right. Okay. Yeah. Let's- so well, nice. I had I had contacted you because um, I had this idea for a, a particular shot um, where I wanted to have like the note that you received from Susan Cucci to be placed down in front of a photo of the two of us. And again, I didn't have a photo of the two of us. So I was like, can we create something? And you were like, yeah, but also can we run lines while we do this? And I was like, I remember you came over. Yeah. Yes. You came here. We took the photo and I'm like, while you're here, do, can we just run through this? And I was like, this is amazing. Somebody wants to do this. Of course. I'm glad. And it, was, it was really nice. And you uh, were helpful that day. Like you were like, if you don't need these lines of dialogue because you have so much, like just cross it out. Like you're okay to cross out things that like you don't need and you don't need to say so much. And it was I had to remind you, Paul, that you are the God of your universe and sometimes less is more, right? But yeah. you did, you did it all so well. I mean, you did, you had a lot of dialogue. I remember those, especially those scenes where you're just going, I think it was pages of just like monologue. <laughs> it's like, and why, was, why would I do that to myself? <laughs> like, good, good for you, man. But you know, you can, you can say the same thing in a paragraph that you can in two pages sometimes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I think this is, this is also a fun story that I've talked about is how I also play like casting director for the show and whatnot. And the hardest roles that I've ever had to cast have been my love interest Mm. because it's sort of that weird email that I have to send to somebody being like, Hey, I would love for you to play this one character, by the way, he's also in love with me. (laughs) Um, but you, I mean, everyone's been really great about it and you were really, yeah. Um, wonderful you had you called me at one point and i saw your name come through and i was like oh this is it he wants to change the whole thing oh no this is like that instant panic uh, and you had not not notes but you just had i even bigger ideas because it was your idea to give doyle the accent i yeah well first of all <laughs> let's go back to you know, saying you have to be in love with me you're such a lovable guy and it was not difficult to have to play someone who is adoring you. It was actually, it was harder to be on the opposite side of the Doyle who is like all sneaky and like, oh, I'm going to screw this guy over. Um, but thanks about the accent. I, the accent came because, you know, you, as you know, you're, you're a much bigger soap opera fan than I am, right? All of these characters throughout decades of soap history have these like, these sides to them, right? That you sometimes don't get to see or explore unless they're getting really desperate for story on the show. So then they're like, oh, you have another brother that's going to come in from, you know, Budapest. And all of a sudden there's the same person playing a different person, but you know, it's the same person. So I'm like, well, if we're going to have suspension of disbelief anyway, we might as well throw it in there and see if it works. We we didn't know if it was going to work, but I think it ended up playing well. I loved it. I love that it gave you the the dimension, the different sides that you could play. You switched it off with when you were with Gene, which was great. Um, I made it like because it wasn't part of the script, so I like added the line that she could say, like knock it off with that silly accent. Yeah. Like it was it just made it so even more sinister, which was mm-hmm. which was great. He's such a sinister guy. <laughs> but so lovable. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know I don't know if I ever told you. Um, I think it was because we we had filmed um, first, like season three, like our, our shooting was very early on when we did the proposal. Um, and Jackie Zeman was was up next after. So she watched a little bit of that. And then she came up to me during the wedding and she was like, you know, it's a, sh- it's a shame we have to kill Doyle because you two have like such great chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that she said that. That's so yeah, sweet. It was. It yeah, was. Yeah. And I, we had fun. Like you, our, our relationship from the moment we met was just so honest. And I think when people can be honest together in real life, and then you're taking it to a medium where honesty kind of disappears because you're playing, it's it, there at least is some sort of grounding of where you can bring two characters from if it's based in an honest environment. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we had that. Yeah. And it was interesting because I didn't really... I, I mean, I, I, I like you as a person. Like, I think you're wonderful. You as well. But I, but I never really, like, saw us... I never saw that chemistry because I was just in it. Like, I just was in it. And I saw it when I was editing. 
And I was like, oh, I see what she's saying. Like, I'm really, like, falling in love with these two as a couple. Like, I uh, want them to succeed. Um, which I thought was interesting because I knew how it would end and whatever. But I was like, it really, I felt like it worked. Like, I felt like people would see them connect. Yeah, I felt, I think it worked too. It was, it was fun to watch it all go down and to play with it and to watch you create the world that you created and all of us just kind of fall into it, especially with some of the veterans and, you know, um, yeah, it, it was, it was a great experience. Did you have um, a favorite scene that we had uh, throughout the season? Like not just you and I, but like, cause aside from myself, I feel like you worked with almost everyone within the cast, at, at least like a minimal amount of uh, time at some point. My fa favorite scene. You know, my favorite, my favorite time of working was when I felt like I was back in, what was the name of the set where everyone would go and like eat dinner and, you know, the restaurant and Guiding Light. Oh, uh, company. Yeah. I felt when we were, when we were at, like at our company, right. Sitting mm -hmm. down at the table and, you know, the, the whole interaction of like me coming over to you at the table and talking and it just, it brought me back to my Guiding Light days where I was at company just kind of like doing my thing and acting like a fool, but just, <laughs> just a different, just a different dynamic. I would, I would say that that was, those were my favorite scenes. So it seems the cat's out of the bag. Paul's filled you ladies in on all the details. I hope you'll be a part of the wedding. We will, but you better take care of this guy. Cause if you don't, I think between Mo and me, we could probably take you. I think you probably can take me too. Anyway, order up, food's on me. Oh, well that it's very kind. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, if you don't mind, while you look over the menu, I'd like to steal my fiance for a moment and talk some wedding business. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll see you in a moment. Cool. It also reconnected you with Stephanie in those moments, which I thought was was nice. So wild. <laughs> yeah, because you guys, I don't remember the last time you had seen each other prior to that day, but like, I remember it like... Yeah, I remember specifically, it was like, oh, this is going to be fun. And Stephanie was looking forward to it that, you know, everyone was going to be together that whole day. Yeah, and we were. And the day flew by and everyone it just everyone was just great. Everyone was there because they wanted to be there, right? No one had to be there. So I think it's different when you're working on something where you're choosing, not because of a paycheck, not because you need to be seen again, not because you need to keep your credits up, but because you just want to play. Yeah. And everyone that day was just getting to play. And how could you not enjoy just playing as an artist, as an actor? Yeah. Uh, well, you brought up uh, Guiding Light, so we'll switch gears for just a, a second. Yeah. Did you uh, did you have any sort of relationship to soap operas prior to joining Guiding Light? No. I, I, <laughs> the only the only relationship that I had to soap operas was I I remember when I was at NYU. My mom, my mom was such a, she was such a, she was a great mom as a mom, but then there's like, you know, there's theater moms, right? Mm -hmm. She wasn't so much a theater mom, but she always would say when I was studying at school, you know, those soap operas, they pay well, they're steady gigs for actors. You might want to look into one of those once, <laughs> you're, once you're graduated and see what that is. And sure enough, like the, my first job out of NYU was um, Guiding Light. And I don't know if you know this, but my my role on Guiding Light started as an under five. So I was I was brought in to play Tammy's boyfriend for this baseball game that was going on that Marty West at the moment was playing Shane and they needed a catcher. And I'm like, I came in, Rob DeSena read me. He goes, all right, th this is going to work. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, it's, you know, it's only two days, but, you know, who knows with these things and blah, 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 blah. And sure enough. After the whole baseball thing went down, Stephanie and I got to be pretty close together. We were we got to know each other, and then um, they just kept writing for me. And it wasn't until about less less than a year where they brought me in and they offered me a contract after being written with an under five and then recurring or whatever they called it. Um, but yeah, that's my 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 trajectory into soaps was just very different than most who would come in and test and come back again and test again and and all that. I was just kind of like brought onto the boat as a piece of luggage <laughs> and my luggage just stayed on the boat while the sun were going off. And yeah. it was a, that was my foray into the soap world. That's awesome. I, I like, um, I like how they just sort of like 
smooth transition right into it, and then you had a, a storyline, and then you were in a love a love uh, relationship with Stephanie, and it was great. I mean, it was perfect. It was fun. You know, they always say, if you knew then what you know now, I was so fresh right out of school that my chops were different, my confidence was different, everything was different, but I, there's not much I would change about it, um, but going back on it, you know, there's, there's so much I would have changed, and you know, we get to play now and we get to, uh, we get to, to redo it. Yeah. You get to make it your, make it your own now and take that life experience and, and mold it into what you're doing now. Yeah. That's so cool. Um, did you have, cause you went to NYU, so you studied, and you studied acting and, and, uh, computer applications as well. Did you, <laughs> I did some research. Uh, what was your big picture when you were, you were growing up, you wanted, you moved to New York to, to go to school. But what was that big picture idea that you had? This is where I'm going to be. This is what I'm going to do. This is going to be life. I think my big picture was Broadway. Um, I, I was, I was a trained singer. I was doing professional theater. I got my equity card at probably the age of seven, eight. Um, and that's why I went to NYU is they had one of the top three, two musical theater programs in the world. Yeah. And uh, that's where I wanted to be. And once I got into New York and into the throes of it all, um, you know, you, you get to see actually what things are. Um, listen, Broadway could still be in the cards. I'm just just I just feel like I'm getting that like that grit. My voice is getting better even as I get older. But that was that was the thing. I wanted to be in New York to be in musical theater. That's awesome. Do you have a do you have a role like an ideal role that you would love to play or that? Um, that was like a dream, like, oh my God, I want to be like Seymour in Little Shop of Horrors or whatever. Oof. <laughs> you know, that's really, that's a great question. That's hard. I, I played one of them in high school, actually. My okay. senior year of high school, I played Professor Harold Hill in The Music Man. Okay. And to this day, I mean, I, I remember, I, I remember the song, You Got Trouble. And I remember learning it being like, I'm never going to learn this song. And to this day, I could still, you got trouble, my friend, right here in trouble, right here in River City. Why sure my bill of pay so my I'd proud to say I'm always mighty proud to say it. I consider that the hours I spend with a cue in my hand are golden. Help me cultivate horse sense, a cool head and a keen eye. I remember like learning that being like, there's no way in hell I'm going to learn this whole song. Um, but that was, that was a role. And I didn't, I didn't expect to play it in high school. So that would be something that I would definitely like to do. Um, and then probably um, Jean Valjean or Javert from Les Mis. I mean, just yeah. powerful men, completely different people um, fighting with a similar type of struggle, uh, but with songs and voices that were just angelic. Um, so yeah, th that, would, that, that would have been a thing then. Oh, I have to pause for one second because I wanna speak about how you are a singer. Um, because I also, the three men that I have, uh, cast as my love interest in Misguided, there was, uh, Chuck in season one, Chris in season two, and you, all singers, like, yeah. coincidentally, like, not planned, can sing, like, musically gifted. Huh. I am not. Um, and so <laughs> in my head, I was like, I think I need to have a musical episode where all three of my love interests so far come back and just sing to me. Um, 100%. And that's funny that you brought that up because when I was studying in, in at NYU, there was no, the, the, the only outlet that any singer really had who was an actor was theater, right? There mm -hmm. was no uh, crazy ex-girlfriend. There was no, there were no shows that, yeah. that let you go to the heightened reality of musicality. And uh, things clearly have changed, you know, the realities of every aspect of what you can see on in film, television, or even on theater have changed. So I love that there are outlets now for uh, actors who have a voice or, a, you know, a real strong yeah. instrument to be able to showcase it in a different medium now as well. So yes, to a misguided episode, we're going to collaborate <laughs> with a great composer. Oh, I've, I've, in my head, I'm like, I think I just need to contact Rachel Bloom and just be like, how do I, how do I do this? Like, yes. you are after. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, trust me. It's like in my head that I think this is happening. <laughs> I, and if, from what I've learned about you, if it's in your head, most likely it will become a reality. Like I have that whole, I have the whole episode. Like I know where I will be and I know how everyone will come into it. I know it's, it's, I'm excited. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. Awesome. Okay. So we'll, we'll go back now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I just, I thought it was so when I, I don't know when I realized it, but I was like, 
I I think I need a musical episode. Like every every person that I've cast as love interest is a singer. That's so it's it's great. You have a knack for hiring talented people. That's a good thing. Yes. I I mean I'm I'm attracted to talent regardless. Like I just think. <laughs> yeah. Uh okay, so you as I have watched many clips now of uh, Justin Klosky to prep, are considered a master organizer. <laughs> <laughs> and so you created the OCD experience. Yes. Tell me about the transition that you took from performer, Justin, going to school for this, and then building a business, like almost completely separate from what that uh, journey was that you were on. And then you were like, oh, here we go. We're going to do this also. <laughs> you know, it's such a long, it, it could be a long drawn out conversation, but I think the, the simplicity of it, which is what OCD is, my, my OCD, right? Not the traditional obsessive compulsive disorder, but the OCD experience is organized, create discipline, which stems from really finding the simplicity in all things through organizational discipline. And it came about in, 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 a, in a handful of ways. So when I was at NYU, I was also working in a talent agency and I learned a lot about the entertainment business going through college. I was offered to be an agent at, at a very young age, um, at 21, and I turned it down only because I didn't see myself pursuing that as a career. Although I do enjoy the aspects of the agency world and the management world, which I, which I did work in for a while. Um, but that's kind of where it came out of was helping other artists find um, simplicity in their lives because most of the artists that I knew, whether it was a director or a writer or an actor or a producer or a singer, it didn't matter, were pretty chaotic <laughs> and had a lot going on. And their, their creativity and their art was, of course, at the forefront of what they were interested in. And you forget as you get older, because you don't know this until you get older, that it's a business. And in order to maintain your business and your business mindset, you need to have tools and resources to maintain it. Yeah. So I was living with, at the time, um, I lived with some really interesting people as roommates in my life. And one <laughs> of them uh, was this guy named Yashar Hadayat. And uh, you might know him. He's a really big uh, political you know, influencer. Um, he just knows a lot about a lot. And he looked at me one day, this was in 2006-ish, <laughs> and he's like, you need to organize people. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Organ what do you organize for what? <laughs> like, there are people out there that help people get organized, Justin. You are the most organized man I've ever met. Look into it. So I remember walking to the Grove and there's the Barnes and Noble there. And I sat down on the floor and they were like, at the time, four books on professional organizing. Now you'd probably find thousands. Yeah. And I read the books from front to back really quickly. One was Julie Morgenstern, one was Peter Walsh, and I forget who the other one was. And I and I remember like having, you know, that I that bulb went off by yourself, but no one yeah. sees the bulb but you, and you're there yeah. you're like, this is fucking easy. What, <laughs> what? People get paid to do this? And naturally it's not that easy for everybody. So I remember going home that day and I called up a couple people who knew about business because I knew nothing about starting a business or getting incorporated or reserving the rights to a trademark or any of the things that go along with it. And because of the great people in my life, I had a lot of support starting the OCD experience. And fortunate for me, the people that I knew that needed help were the artists that I knew in my life from going to NYU, working at the talent agency, working at the management companies that I worked at when I was doing the assistant work. And that's where it's, that's where the business started. And, uh, it, it naturally transitioned because I did work at a couple restaurants growing up. Some were, most were in high school. I tried out of college and I knew that wasn't going to be the way for me. Mm -hmm. Um, even though it was probably the most flexible out of all things. And I, I remember that day where I was like, wait a minute, this is flexible also. I can have something where I can make money and I can also then have my life. And um, sure enough, it just started and then it kept going. And then other people kept me on fire because you lose your light sometimes and you lose your yeah. fire when you're by yourself building something. You have to, you have to reignite the light. You gotta reignite the light. <laughs> 
So yeah, and if it if it wasn't for some of the the most supportive friends in my life, I never would have written my book yeah. because I remember my friend Ross is like, Justin, if you're going to keep doing this, and this was probably five years into my business, if you're going to keep doing this, you need to write a book. You need to be an expert. And then I wrote the book, and then the book got published, and then I was on TV again doing what I was what I was naturally doing, except as myself. Yeah. Um, and now I get to continue to help people and showcase you know, the, the ease of certain aspects of getting organized, staying organized and finding the discipline of being organized through my business. I think that that's a really interesting thing too, because you can watch, I like, I, I watch, you know, the whole, um, what's her name on uh, condo, Marie Kondo. Oh yeah. Um, and like, it's, it's a great, whatever. Um, but you can do it. Like you can get organized. You can, you can get the, the bins and put everything in and whatever, but then you, you have to keep it up. And I think that that's where you you include the discipline to continue it. Uh, I love you so much for <laughs> understanding that because there are a lot of organizers out there and I don't need to name names, it doesn't matter, that come in and zhuzh, we call it yeah. zhuzhing. Um, and by the way, clients every now and then will, will ask me if I will zhuzh for them and help them set up a really beautiful room for a photo shoot for an op, right? Yeah. And that's not my thing usually. I like to get to the heart of things. And there is a bunch of people uh, that have built their business on zhuzhing, making things look pretty, leaving the client. And I will be honest with you, 80% of those clients end up calling my business later on. And I see their work and their labels and it's all done, but we come <laughs> in and we're like, well, they did this for you, but did they teach you what to do next once they leave? Yeah. And most of them don't know. And honestly, it's not just the or other organizers fault. It's sometimes the client's fault because they're not interested and they don't have the time. But a big thing for me now is if I'm working with a client, unless again, it's very specific of them wanting something for a very unique reason, I will say, well, listen, here's the process. Here's what we do. Here's why it's OCD, organize, create and discipline. Okay. And here's what you can do when we leave. So we might not ever have to come back. Yeah. I don't want to be your dentist. You know, I want to be your plastic surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. That's a great analogy. I think it's the first time I've ever used it. So that I'm glad that we, we got yeah, it. That, keep uh, it, keep it. Cause I think that that works. <laughs> right. Cause unless it's botched, you're going to, you're going to usually go away and not see your plastic surgeon for God knows how long. So like right. that would be the goal. And granted, yeah, I'm putting myself out of business a little bit, but the clients appreciate it. And then it allows us to move on yeah. to other people who need help. Yes, I yeah. think so. I um, I know. I think you know this about me. I'm a, I'm a manny. I, I take care of little littles, and uh, Oliver, who's five and a half, loves organizing. Like it's because I like to organize and I like to have things like very neat and, and in its place. And it just has translated into him to like clean up his toys and put them in different places. And he's very in love with Paw Patrol. Like has like if there's a Paw Patrol toy, he he owns it. Huh? Like, so he has like it's his room is like Paw Patrol Central, but he loves organizing them, and he can tell like he can tell you when he got each toy, who they're from, like what they do, and like various different whatever. But he loves organizing them and loves to like put them in the bin, make sure that everything's in their place. When he's done, I make sure that he puts them back so that his room is nice and clean. And there's some days that he uh, like I'll show up you know after the weekend and come back and he's like my room is a mess and i was like well good thing we got all day that we could we could clean it today we could judge <laughs> and uh but he he gets it and he told his teachers you know when he was meeting them this year he's like i can help you organize the classroom and they were like who are you <laughs> okay, so I, I have a couple of questions about this because i find it fascinating when kids innately gravitate towards organizing right because yeah. my niece is that way as well um, I think it's a couple of things, right? One, I was, I want to ask you this. Are any of his parents that way? One. No. <laughs> okay, I'm not, I'm not the reason. No. Well, I just was thinking, I was like, they're going to watch this. So, uh, yeah. That's no. okay. We're not talking bad about them, right? We're just, I'm just trying to get the facts. So yeah, none, yeah. neither one of his parents are, are, are organized. Um, you are clearly organized because you wouldn't be able to produce and direct and act and learn lines mm -hmm. and set up series and Manny, right? <laughs> so you have that in you. So he clearly is pulling that from you, but I'm, I'm a big believer on epigenetics and, um, the passing down of DNA. And the reason why I asked his parents were because there's somewhere I guarantee you in his lineage 
where one of his people were that way. And, and it comes out, right? And because of you and being able to show him the ease of that, he picked up on it even, even easier and became more confident in that. So I love that because I think that's a tool that most kids don't know and need that will enable them to thrive later down the line because absolutely man we're especially as an as an artist right taking away let's separate me now from ocd and being an actor right i, I don't know how other actors do it right when when they're living their lives they got their stuff going on they might be shooting something they might be not then they get an audition and then they get another audition in oh memorize and deal with these nine pages you need to be it needs to be on on camera in, in a day and a half or a day or less than a day it's like how do you drop everything you're doing, deal with what you're doing, have the rest of your life going, and then maintain order and, and confidence in that? And I think if they would have taught that in NYU, <laughs> maybe 25, 30% of the actors would have been more successful because like you lose yourself in that. And it's 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 a tool. It's a, it's a necessary tool in this day and age to find some sort of semblance. And the fact that, you know, he is doing that these days and, <laughs> and will probably continue to. Yeah. Like he's so lucky to have you. I think, I think so too, but, <laughs> but it's, but it's also him like learning what organizing means. And like, he's like, Oh, I put it, I put it all here and it's organized. But I was like, it's great that, you, but there needs to be sort of, sort of a purpose to this. Like you, if it's functional, like cool, like you can, you know where things are and like, you just can't throw everything together and be like, Oh, it's organized now. But like, there's a purpose, there's a rhyme, there's a reason for everything that that's laid out. And it, slowly, but I mean, he's only five. So like, but, he but, knows, you know, but he's building he knows it. Because the purpose for him now is when he wants to find his Paw Patrol. Yeah. That's exactly where it is. Oh, and for it sure. makes him feel good and comforted. And that is, that's the essence of it. That's what I told him too. I said, once everything is you know, in its place or once everything you like, you feel good about everything, it's going to translate in into your inside. Like it's going to make you feel really good and not anxious because I would walk into his room and I was like, Ugh. <laughs> like I, there's a lot going on in here. Yeah. Yeah. That's great that you see the the balance of that for him. Yeah. We're yeah. Gonna, yeah. Um, okay. So aside from Manny, whatever, uh, you, Mr. Seem very focused, very clear headed, very like, determined in everything. And I'm curious if there's a piece of advice that you've received that helped shape that sort of mentality to like be very like, I don't know if that means anything. Yeah, no, of course it does. First of all, thank you. That's, that's kind of you. Um, <laughs> it's taken a little bit to get there. Yeah. yeah I, um, I would agree. I think it's, it's a, it's a learned experience. It's a practice that you have to maintain and keep up. And I think the one thing would be is the world is chaotic. We, inna we innately as human beings are part of this chaos. And I think for me, what I've learned in the last, let's say decade, cause I just turned 40, right? So between 30 and 40, a man really like, I think a, a man really becomes a man. Yeah. Is trusting your instincts and the feelings inside of you, not the thoughts, because our thoughts are ultimately flawed. Yeah. Trusting our feeling of what's right and not right. And I call it now the light and the dark, right? Okay. When I'm when I'm in a situation and I'm feeling lit up and I'm 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 light, that's where I want to be. When I'm in a situation and I'm feeling heavy and dark and my body is feeling that. I know that I should be moving away from that. And I think it seems so simple, right? Yeah. But it's a practice. And once you can understand that and, and, and trust your own instincts of what the light and the dark is for yourself, then you could start moving into a more calm and peaceful state of mind yeah. um, and become conscious of the dark and the light and what that energy is doing to you because that energy affects everything in your life, whether you know it or not. It affects the personal relationships. It affects your work. It affects your working relationships. It affects your romantic relationships. It affects how you, your relationship with yourself. Yeah. And if you could be, um, if you could be in that place and aligned with that, then I think it's easier to make choices 
that are, as I would call it, in the light. Um, that would be the overall theme for, for, for what you asked. I love it. Um, I think this will be my final, final question. Cause I, I actually love asking this about to people because it seems to be different for everyone and everyone sort of has a different experience with it. Yeah. Um, but you, you seem to have, a, I'm going to say this, you're very, I, you come across very successful to me. Like, I think that I, I admire everything that you have done and put out there and, and, um, very well put together. Um, thank you. You're welcome. I don't feel that way all the time, but oh. it's nice to know that other people. Feel that way. <laughs> I mean, the perception is like, I, I get that from you. Like, I very much think that you have, you know, it going on like you're good. Um, did you have a moment to realize somewhere in your life, ah, I've made it. I set out to do something. I'm successful. I, I, uh, I don't know. Like, I just had that. This is it. This is, I'm. I'm really, I got it. Huh. If that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. And as I'm sure you can relate to this as well, what we think are those moments of success and triumph are never what we think those moments of success and triumph are. <laughs> yeah. Right? I bet when you wrapped the first season of Misguided, you were like, yes, this yeah. is it. And then you're like, oh, what's next? Yes. Right. And yep. I think, I think that is the definition of success is knowing that there never really is an end all of what success is. Success is success is inside, right? That's so cheesy to say, but it, it is, it's, it's the, the feeling of gratitude because on a, on a Monday at 10 30, I could be sitting here with you having this conversation knowing that like the next thing on my schedule is lunch with a dear friend's publicist, you know, that I, I don't have to be sitting behind some desk. That's success for me, right? Yeah. Not the next paycheck, not the next cool new client, not the next TV show, because those, those moments of success that we think are going to elevate us, that we think are going to make us feel better. They're just external things coming into us because we've allowed ourselves to show up for those moments, right? So I think it's, for me now, it's living in the, it's living in the gratitude of, wow, I'm healthy. I have great people around me. I've weeded out the shitty people around me and I know better <laughs> to not gravitate towards those people anymore. <laughs> and I get to show up for people like yourself, for me, for my clients and not worry about, again, the external that I think is going to make me feel better about myself or make other people think better of me because it's all bullshit. It's all, it's all facade. It's all this story that we're creating for ourselves to fit in better or to be liked more when it's, again, it's, it's, it's the self, it's just the self love stuff. Yeah. And you can't teach that. Like you can, <laughs> you can listen to great people talk about it, but you have to practice it. And yeah. for me being mindful, uh, saying gratitude prayers. And these are, by the way, 10 years ago, you'd never hear any of this stuff coming out of my mouth. <laughs> like, I'd be like, what, who mindfulness, gratitude, hire of like, mm. yeah. but that's what that's, that's for me, what success is these days. And then when those moments come, like the next great opportunity, whatever that looks like, it just kind of moves into all the other beautiful things that are flowing in that river. And just the river becomes clearer and lighter and more free. And there's less rocks and boulders in your way. And you get to invite other people in and go on a beautiful journey. And then before you know it, you're dead anyway. <laughs> and you, you, you hopefully either, you know, the way that I think you either move on to the next realm because you've learned all of the, the new things that you needed to learn a hell on earth, sure. or you come back to hell on earth because you didn't figure it out and you have to do it all over again. Yep. Yeah. I think that that's, a, that's like, a perfect way to look at it too. Like I, I, I've tried to have this conversation with a lot of people and it's, it's creative people are very interesting to ask this question to because the level of success is very different for everybody. And their definition is very different. It's unlike, I think it's unlike any other field where their, their success is, this is my job. I, I did this, I, I make this amount of money. I have a house, blah, 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 blah. But like creative people don't think like that. And it's, and it's fascinating to have that, that conversation and 
figure out what that idea is for each individual because it's different for everybody. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, Justin, I thank you so much for for coming on the misguided journey, for doing the show, for being my Doyle and my love interest, uh, for doing this, you are a ray of light and it's been shining on you this entire time, which I think is yeah, just- Yeah, it's like, <laughs> I got my 11, 11, 1030 <laughs> light coming in over here. I'm like, I hope people know that my hair is mainly dark. It's not all light and gray. I, I don't know what hair journey you have taken for, <laughs> for this 2020, but I have been on it with you and I am obsessed with it. Oh, my hair was, remember my hair was like down to here at one yes. point. I, I saw my, my friend Jason, who's been cutting my hair since I was literally 18 in New York. And I walked in and he's like, so can we talk about this? <laughs> I'm like, always. And he's like, you look like you're homeless and also a grunge rock star. Can I, <laughs> can I do something about this? I'm like, fine. I kind of like being a homeless grunge rock star. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was, whatever, but, but I do, I like what it is now and I like the length and I like the sides mm. and everything. It's, I appreciate that, man. As someone that doesn't have any to like play with at all. It's just, it's nice to live vicariously. Listen, some people. of my favorite haircuts, you've seen me my, with my head shaved. Yeah. Some of my favorite haircuts are yours with nothing on the top of my head. I wake up every morning and I just like rub a little bit of water and I'm out the door. So simple. Yeah. I mean, this was not necessarily my choice, but it would, it's very simple and it's very nice. Hey, you're to lucky it suits you. I'm very lucky. You're lucky you have a good, you have a good shaped dome. Very nice. It's, there's no lumps or anything, which is great. And by the way, and back to you, thank you for having me. Thanks for making the time. I'm really excited to see you take your next, uh, next step with whatever it is, whether it's misguided or another project, because I know you're not going to stop and know that I'm always here to support you and whoever's watching out there, watch misguided. Check out all the work that Paul has done because it is remarkable, especially for someone who didn't have any experience really doing any of this, to learn it all, to figure it out, to call the actors, to make it happen. It's not an easy thing. So hats off to you for that. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll end on that note because that was that was beautiful. I'm going to hit pause and end the recording. Amazing. <laughs>